we aggregate that data and provide insights, notifications, alerts, and corrective actions based on what's going on within the supply chain so that shippers, uh, brokers, 3PLs, and, and every member of the chain can make sure that their freight stays visible, intact, on time, and secure. Um, so we are going to be doing a supply chain chat today. This is a new um, webinar series we'll be doing where we cover various topics in the supply chain industry. Today, we'll be talking about uh, 3PLs, brokers, what's going on in the space, some of the trends we're seeing, as well as um, from our security lens and our visibility lens, uh, some of the, the trends we're seeing there. And of course, we want to thank our partner, Siva Logistics, today for sponsoring the webinar and making all this possible. So we'll jump in um, with a, a statement piece here. Uh, Joe, if you wanna read that out for us and get us yeah. started. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, a really, it's a really interesting statement piece that uh, the brokering market has jumped 20% since the start of COVID. And I suppose given that um, when COVID first hit, uh, uh, the supply chain slowed down a lot, uh, would indicate that that 20% um, is really picking up pace now in, in, the, in the second year, 2021 uh, or so. But it's, a, it's an interesting statistic, which I think plays into the whole state of the, uh, the supply chain. What has happened that brokers are going increasing by 20%? Is it that logistics in general has increased by 20% and we're pushing it into the, the market that, that has the same capacity. Has there been a backlog of um, product that needs to be uh, moved around and now shippers are moving to brokering for that and why would that be the case? So if we just go back a small bit and say why um, what has happened to the supply chain in the last two years, especially since COVID? Um, and why is it an interesting subject all of a sudden? Why is CNN and BBC and everyone talking about supply chain and making uh, boring logistic people like us suddenly uh, interesting and have something to say in the bar about supply chain? <laughs> but, um, but it has certainly piqued everyone's interest, probably because there's been shortages and now there is delays. And what is causing that? And why is that causing brokering to go up 20%? What, what, what would you think the main causes would be? Uh, kind of? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because like you said, supply chain has never been in the forefront of the public's minds before. It's a, it's a hot topic really, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, but you can really look back and see that it is a supply chain impact at every stage of the chain from manufacturing to last mile. It, yeah. We of course saw the first kind of impact with um, the toilet paper shortages, PPE, sanitizer, um, as soon as the COVID-19 pandemic hit in 2020, that was everyone's first taste of um, empty grocery store shelves as well, um, where people started to think about it. But now we've kind of seen a much larger macro impact. The supply chain, because of the pandemic, as well as a few other industry uh, vectors as well. Of course, the manufacturing was impacted um, due to um, factory capacity, factory shutting down due to the, due to the pandemic. Of course, the microchip shortages and um, the um, dynamics there around Fabric, fabrication capacity, moving over to ocean containers, the availability of those, um, ships stacking up at ports, taking three months to get unloaded. And then coming into domestic um, trucking with driver shortages, um, not being able to get a driver to pick up your freight and eventually leading to empty shelves shortages. So we're really seeing that uh, trend and that bullwhip effect affect the entire supply chain. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. Uh, the, when production slowed down initially, um, and now we're having that 
sort of traffic jam effect that uh, everything has uh, built up. And in a just-in-time uh, system where everything is moving along nice and smoothly, anything that upsets that. And, um, and sometimes it's quite simple things like the, um, the evergreen getting stuck in the Suez Canal and you'd go, well, surely that hasn't impacted. But it impacted to the, to the state that um, there was a traffic jam uh, go, trying to get into the Suez Canal. And a traffic jam means there's more ships at sea, um, there's more containers on those ships, um, and that is adding to the container uh, problem. Then they all arrive at once in, say, uh, Long Beach or, or LA, and there's just not the capacity to unload. Them. So, the uh, as you as you just uh, rightfully said, you know, there there was probably you could probably transit the port in uh, in a number of days, and now it's taking weeks. And even the build up, the knock on effect there is not just getting containers off ships, but getting trains and trucks to move them once they're off. So. Uh, I think I read today that there was uh, 80,000 um, containers sitting in New York and uh, that there's no capacity. So the smallest of things blocking up the system um, uh, has caused this traffic jam. Uh, rail, uh, rail upgrades in Eastern Europe have backed up trains uh, in Eastern Europe again containers sitting on the trains, things not moving, all at a time where demand has increased. So uh, at the start of COVID, where there was no production and people were staying at home, they weren't spending their money on entertainment or going out uh, for meals, etc. They were buying things. And now those things are beginning to come through the, the, the process. So are come through the come through the chain and we're having this effect. So I, when we go back to this 20% um, increase with brokering, um, it, it's not that um, it, it's that there's 20% looking for somewhere to be able to uh, push through an already creaking um, system. So I think that's really, I, I think that statistic sort of, when you dig into it, tells you a lot of things. But why, why would brokering go up? Um, why wouldn't shippers just stick to what they have previously been doing? Why has brokering become an option, do you think? So great question, Joe. And it's Brokerage, of course, brokerage and, and using 3PLs has always been a huge thing in supply chain and folks do it for better capacity. Those 3PLs and brokers have better reach throughout the network to be able to go and find a driver. Um, and as a result of that scale that they have, they're able to offer competitive pricing as well. And that's always been the case. But now when you can't even find a dedicated carrier to provide drivers, uh, to ship your goods, you have to go to the folks that have the connections, as well yeah. as the pricing, to be able to make that happen and move your goods and keep your supply chain moving. So um, the reasons are the same, but the need and the demand is so much greater now um, to use brokers. Yeah, yeah. So so shipper, shippers are just finding it difficult to move their um, extra product through the systems that they had, so they're going to brokers. But yep. uh, and, I suppose and, uh, is... and just ahead. just an anecdotal example, I've had a, a client that traditionally only used dedicated, right? It was a, a, a point of, of honor, right? Only using and maintaining dedicated carry mm -hmm. network. Due to this, these issues in the supply chain, they've gone and started using brokers. They have to, they've got to keep their stuff moving. Yeah, yeah. I, but I, I... I suppose if the, if that's a let's call it an emergency measure or a redundancy uh, uh, measure on their be on their behalf to go to brokers, but not all brokers are the same. Uh, I, broker, there's big brokers, there's small brokers, etc. So the bigger the broker with the with the bigger reach, obviously uh, 
they can push more capacity into, into the system. Yeah, so, so brokers, choosing a broker is nearly as important as choosing your own um, carriers. But there's probably a fear with some people that if you're brokering and you start hearing about double brokering, that you start losing visibility on where this is going. So what does double brokering, what's double brokering mean? So double brokering, Joe, <clears throat> It's what it says on the box, really. But double brokering is when you've brokered out your asset. Of course, you've gone, you need capacity, you need a driver, and that broker will find a carrier for you. But that carrier that's been contracted for the load also brokers out their load, their assignment to another carrier. And suddenly you've lost visibility to who is owning that freight, who has responsibility, do they understand the requirements around that load? Um, it's a huge issue. And it, and it opens up uh, visibility risks uh, to freight. Yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it I absolutely agree. And I think it also opens up risks beyond visibility that um, when you're pushing product by need to brokers and double brokering or um, as carriers uh, brokering themselves uh, haven't, haven't got the business, uh, the rules that you have in place to take care of your um, shipments start to break down. They don't get translated through all the different steps. And, and I think that's where um, criminality takes the opportunity of saying, people don't know what's happening in the supply chain or they don't have total visibility or they're not actually sure who is carrying their goods. So therefore, if a truck is stolen or a truck is pilfered, um, uh, it, it takes a while to, to, for those um, incidences to come back up through the system for, for a shipper to go, oh, I've got a problem here. Um, initially, they just want product moved from A to B and they're not overly concerned so long as it arrives at B. But when the problems start happening, then they want to, to know visibility. And, and sometimes I think people forget that criminals are actually really smart, that they're not naive to the fact that the whole supply chain is really under pressure and people are brokering and double brokering and everything that you said. And uh, they see that, they, they operate best in the mist and, uh, and say, well, people don't know. I can park this truck here. I can collude with drivers. I can, uh, I see there's more trucks stopped at this truck stop uh, because there's a shortage of drivers and they need to take their breaks in places that they probably wouldn't normally take breaks, uh, et cetera. And crime has gone up. Uh, this isn't anecdotal. So crime in the US, for example, um, cargo crime went up 23% in 2020. I think another really interesting fact about that is that the value of the crime went up 41%. So that means certain products are being targeted. And again, we have to sort of give respect to the, uh, to the criminal who understands uh, supply and demand as much as the logistic industry understands supply mm -hmm. and demand. And again, that's evident by the markups that stolen goods are getting. So when everything is moving nicely and supply and demand is nicely balanced, um, criminals can expect 20, 30% on stolen goods. Uh, but Interestingly, now, when everything is backed up and demand is outstripping supply, there are certain products that are actually getting more than the recommended retail price. So they're getting 150% for certain products. And I find that really interesting that they are the products being targeted and they are the products that they'll go after because that's where the profit margin is. And even fast moving consumer goods like 
toilet roll and kitchen roll and baby food and nappies, uh, et cetera, things that you wouldn't overly expect to be targeted are being targeted because the demand is there. And instead of getting 10 cent on the dollar, they're getting 30, 40, 50 cent uh, on the dollar. So the strains are not only um, a visibility issue, they're, they're panning down into the problem with um, with criminality and uh, and not only um, criminality, but um, when you don't have that kind of visibility, you have you have issues with just product not arriving on time, product being left in yards, drivers uh, missing their slot, dumping the trailer and 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 heading home because they are so exhausted from uh, working that month. So. The system under strain gives opportunity to problems happening. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's incredible too. They're taking advantage of it. And then if those loads do get stolen or pilfered, uh, pilferage, of course, we've seen a huge increase in. Um, there's no inventory coming behind that stolen inventory to replenish that, that shelf because everything else is stuck at the port. Um, yeah. There's that limited amount of supply coming in, that has to be protected to get out to distribution and out to customers because the rest of the goods is gonna take some time yeah. to get out there. Yeah, just, so, just on that pilfering point, you're absolutely, your pil pilfering has gone up dramatically in the, in the last few years. And, and we used to, used to classify pilfering as um, when you'd unload the truck, there was, bits missing off the uh, off the load and you're sort of going was it put on was it not put on the um where did that go missing but now it's definitely pilfering as in the doors are open the seals are broken the the, the pallets are broken down and 40 50 60 items are taken and the reporting of pilferage has gone up dramatically because it's got into the area now of um, insurance. So people want insurance for those 50, 100 products that are, are missing. So it's being uh, reported and not just um, reported because of the difference, uh, as I said, but the amount of trucks um, at truck stops uh, with the seal being broken and product being taken is, uh, is just on the up. Definitely, and um, and that's probably that's probably an issue as well. The risks that double brokering is giving. So beyond that, what other um, what other risks about um, double brokering or double loading? What's what's double loading, for example? All the doubles here. Well, yeah, lots of lots of doubles going on. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 a pretty frightening scenario. So of course. Taking it back from what you said, uh, the load has been double brokered, let's say. It, at worst, that driver is not aware of the compliance requirements for this shipment. There's no formal business relationship with this carrier that the shipper has or, or the 3PL has. So we've got a kind of a, a loose cannon scenario, potentially. One big thing that we've seen moving to, to double loading is um, we've seen carriers uh, take loads to their yards, secure yards. Um, and then actually, um, although they've been contracted for a full truckload, they're able to open that um, trailer up, load additional freight. Um, we've seen a technology product loaded with uh, produce, lettuce, um, <laughs> in one example. Um, loading it double, kind of getting double billing for the shipment when uh, really an FTL was paid for. And you know that doesn't always have nefarious results, but it does affect the integrity of the cargo. And they can lead, of course, if they're getting past the seal to pilfering those loads uh, before they make it to their final destination as well. So it's kind of creating a lot of visibility questions there. What's going yeah. on with my freight? Yeah, I think, uh, and, and we have seen a huge increase in that. I mean, sometimes, they just outright cut the sale and say we're double loading and um, and say we didn't realize or we weren't told or we couldn't uh, uh, etc. But it, but another practice that 
that we've seen lately is actually removing the bolts uh, so that the seal is not broken. So, so definitely trying to uh, hide the fact that they're, that they're double loading. So um, I think the, the pictures on the screens there, we have got a lot of instance where uh, the bolt is removed, but, but, um, but the actual uh, seal uh, remains intact. And then, as you say, it's double loaded, and it's not. It's not just for, it, well, for them, it's commercial reasons. Um, but it opens it opens up the load then to be pilfered, or the integrity of the load, uh, as you say, to be compromised. Now, the the reason people pay for full truck loads is that. Uh, it's not compromised with a, with a product that might contaminate it, uh, et cetera. Or in, the, or in the, say, the pharmaceutical industry, the mere fact that the door was open and you can't guarantee the integrity uh, of that product puts that product at, at risk and has knock-on effects for the, uh, for, for the shipper. So it, it's, um, yeah, it's interesting. And, and I also think it's, it, it's interesting that in some cases where we have discovered um, this, uh, the, the carrier will say, yes, I am doing it. I'll openly say that they are doing it because of the pressure they are under to, um, uh, to deliver. And as you say, sometimes it's just out of pure commercial reasons. Um, and uh, other times it's exposing the load to, um, it's exposing the load to theft, which, which we have also seen because there was one case where there was um, a truck at a truck stop. Uh, we detected that the, the doors were open. We presumed it was a, or we concluded it was a pilferage, uh, which it was. But, uh, but when the police arrived, the seal was intact and the doors were closed. So the driver realized I can open this, the back of this truck. And, uh, and pilfer because he had seen it happen uh, at the carrier's yard. So uh, it's, it's just a bad practice and it's going to cause um, problems. What is there solutions to that coming? So there are solutions and we'll, we'll spend some time um, talking about what specifically those mm -hmm. are. But at the end of the day, it's visibility that mm -hmm. the shippers need and the three PLs need to ensure that this cargo is moving through the supply chain safely. You what does, got what this, does visibility mean? Connor? What's visibility? So, good question. And it's it's a term that's kind of changed in definition or or meaning over time. But visibility is really several things combined into one. It's of course from a logistics angle, making sure that the freight arrives on time for customer service reasons. Um, from an integrity angle, it's making sure that uh, precious cargo doesn't get dropped. It doesn't get exposed to um, unnecessary humidity or temperature, especially in the pharmaceutical and food and, and um, consumer goods space. Um, but it also means security as well. So where is my freight right now? Where is it headed? Has it deviated from route? Is uh, the door of the trailer open somewhere it shouldn't be? So it really, it pulls together a combination of various um, important points in the supply chain that shippers through PLs want to know. And what you've seen is um, stepping in and using brokerage due to the industry dynamics is uh, shippers may think they're losing visibility, but they don't have to if they partner with the right 3PLs that understand this need for visibility and are deploying technologies to make this happen. Yeah. Is, is that a top-down demand? Do, do you... I mean, people want to know where their goods are. So uh, is, that, is that becoming a requirement for shippers to say, we'll go to brokers or we'll go to 3PLs that can show us that? Yeah, so traditionally, and looking back the past 20 years, we've seen shippers typically drive those um, mostly security-focused programs, um, putting tracking devices in the cargo um, of their own volition to verify what's going on in their network. What we're seeing a lot of now is um, shippers looking for that one-stop shop 3PL that can provide that visibility for them and can actually verify that to them as well. Actually show me what you're doing. What programs do you have in place to ensure that my freight stays safe on the way to its destination? 
So we're seeing a bit of a shift there um, where 3PLs are being seen as you really need to be providing this visibility service. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I also think, I mean, absolutely, we have to have visibility. We have to get all these data sources, data points uh, onto, onto a system where we can see what's happening. But beyond saying, that's where my truck is, um, and it's on time, um, uh, et cetera. There's other components uh, around that, like who picked up my truck, who, what, who the carrier is, et cetera. Because that kind of information really plays when there is an incident. Um, looking at a dot on the screen and uh, being able to know what that dot means and being able to react to it with um, corrective actions, uh, et cetera. So visibility, absolutely, you have to have it, but then you have to build in what your plan is, what the, what, what the, what the shipper wants, what the carrier broker, et cetera, is able to deliver. And knowing the whole integrity uh, of it beyond um, whether it's on time, uh, et cetera. The reasons I say that, the, the reasons I, I say that is because in my end of the business, we deal with incidences. So, so if you have an incident where there's a dot on the screen and someone says that truck is stolen, it's a very limited amount of data to be able to do something about it. But um, knowing who the carrier is, knowing who the shipper is, knowing whether they're on the right route, they're not on the right route, whether they should have stopped there, whether they didn't stop there, and all these compounding factors that has led to that event um, gives you a much greater chance of being able to recover it or find out, um, or find out what has uh, happened. As well as visibility of the actual shipment. There's also visibility of the context in which the shipment is moving. So um, is it moving on a route that historically um, is very bad for crime? Is it uh, moving into uh, heavy weather? Is there a bridge down? Is there a flood? Is there a civil dispute? So what will as much as you want to keep the integrity of your shipment on time at the right temperature, uh, et cetera, also knowing all this contextual data uh, will give you an understanding of the risk that your shipment is, uh, is going. So um, I suppose an example of that was when there was um, fairly major civil unrest in uh, Colombia there a few months ago. So we're looking at shipments on the road. So if we're just looking at the shipment, we're saying it's on the road, it's moving, everything is fine. Knowing that it's heading into a town where they're burning down police stations is the important visibility there. So you can stop them, you can turn them around, you can put them into a safe haven, you can assess the situation, uh, et cetera. Or even some mundane things like a, a bridge collapsing in Mexico backs up the motorway for 20 miles. There are trucks everywhere and um, uh, criminals see it as a shopping fest. There's trucks parked on the side of the road and we're going to open the back of them and see if we uh, hit the jackpot. So um, again, knowing that the truck has stopped and applying that stop to agreed rules with the with the the carrier or the broker or the shipper saying is the truck allowed stop there um, uh, and why has it stopped and what are we going to do about it so visibility enables corrective and predictive actions and uh, and I think that's key I think that's key to to uh, shippers as well that they are able to make decisions. Well, great points, Joe. Um, you mentioned, so you spoke a lot about kind of in-transit context, in-transit reactivity and, and prevention as well. Um, we did speak a lot about kind of fictitious pickup, double brokering. How does one go to prevent that from happening? What kind of solutions are, are out on the market for that? Yeah. 
And, and, and this is where I think the, this is where the increase in crime, uh, et cetera, is happening. Because when the system is under pressure, um, rules get broken. And um, so uh, you're in a carrier yard and, and uh, someone turns up to, with some false documentation. You simply don't have time to do the due diligence, uh, et cetera. So if, if we go back to the very first um, slide when we're saying brokers have gone up by 20%, it's so important that you pick brokers and, and, um, and 3PLs, et cetera, that have the capacity to ensure the, the, uh, that rules are still applied uh, during these times of pressure. That, that's where the, where the real people um, come to the top in, in the capacity to still apply the rules. So there has been a lot of um, false pickups, uh, et cetera. But again, technology can solve that and technology can solve anything really if, if it's applied. So um, having a system that will do uh, pre-departure checks, uh, take pictures of drivers, take pictures of the truck, take pictures of the registration, the, the, the bill of lading, uh, et cetera. Do they have enough fuel to, to get outside the, the red zone? Does the driver have enough hours left that he's not going to go 20 miles down the road and park by the side of the road um, in, in a hotspot? So um, sitting down with a client, understanding what the rules are and how we apply those rules and what corrective actions we will take if the, um, if the rules are broken. That's key. That's, that's really key. When the, when the product goes to a broker, goes to another broker, goes to down the line, in some cases, as you rightfully said there the last time, in probably the best case, the, the driver doesn't know that he's not meant to stop. Uh, uh, in the worst case, he absolutely knows he's not meant to stop and does it. So, uh, so that to, technology can do a lot of things. Technology can do a lot to tell us what's happening with the load as well. Um, I mean, there's numerous devices you might want to talk about there that will do that, Connor. What, what, what would they be? There's so many devices that can provide um, real-time information, temperature, location, understanding of a door has been open in real time while in transit. There's, there's so many technological options that a shipper or a 3PL can use to create visibility in their supply chain, as well as deploying technology to the dock to ensure that if I'm an assuming carrier ABC is going to come pick up this load, I already have that in my system. The dock worker can reference that quickly and understand, okay, well, carrier XYZ, is actually shown up here. Something's not right. I'm going to contact my manager and understand what's going on here. Maybe the salute has been double brokered. It's all about giving the folks the real-time information that they need to make the right decisions and understand what's going on in as real time as possible. And really, I, I think a, a core aspect here, right, is yes, there's capacity issues. You have to go and, and use three bills and brokers that have that capacity at the price that you can afford as well, but it doesn't have to be at the expense of security and visibility as well. It's um, it's possible to have the best of both worlds in a win-win scenario and still move your freaks to your customers. Yeah. Do, you, do you see that visibility requirement? Um, you know, we're, we're saying that it's been pushed down, but um, there was a statistic, um, there was a statistic that, 41% uh, uh, of shippers are saying that uh, visibility is going to be their biggest um, investment in, in 2022. Yeah. So, um, so is it shippers that want um, brokers, carriers, et cetera, to supply them with that visibility? Or are they getting the visibility themselves or they want access to it? It's really both, um, and that can vary across industries and across companies, but shippers want to use 3PLs that have a visibility mindset, and they want to go on that journey with them. At the same time, they're also using multiple 3PLs in a lot of cases, 
and that can create a lot of division in their data, having to go into multiple portals to access what, where is my freight here, this 3PL, where is my freight with this 3PL. They really need that single unified view of what is going on in their supply chain because they're never going to just use one transportation partner and they need to have one a one-stop shop to understand what's going on with their freight. So it's really both. They need that consolidated view and then they need the 3PLs and brokers in on it with them to really protect that supply chain and keep it visible as well. So, so, so that's probably the flexibility that's required in that shippers have different requirements depending on what they are shipping. Um, they have different risks. They want to know temperature in some cases. They want to make sure that this very valuable load never stops uh, uh, in, in areas. So they all have different requirements and it's matching, um, matching the requirements to the technology and technology can basically do anything. As, as you said, it can tell us that there's a door open, that the temperature is wrong, um, uh, et cetera, Match, matching it to that and then being able to see it on a single platform. That's, that's probably, the, that's probably the, the perfect scenario uh, for a shipper if they can get over dealing with three or four different, um, uh, different systems, yeah. You know, it really is just about partnering with that ethical transportation company that shares your vision for your supply chain, understands your requirements, mm -hmm. and helps you execute and maintain and report on those requirements in the supply chain. It's the only way to do it um, okay. with, with the way transportation is moving right now. Yeah, yeah. And we've really come, if, we, if we're going back uh, to the circle, it has become really... Uh, evident now that uh, when when product is backed up, when things are sitting in uh, ports or on trains in Eastern Europe, or, or uh, that we really want to know what's happening where, <laughs> and uh, and what's what's changing all of that. I, even even down to geopolitical uh, issues, train trains backing up. Uh, on the eastern side of Belarus, and then Belarus is blacklisted because they forced a plane down. And you'd go, what's that got to do with logistics? Well, it has a lot to do with logistics because the trains aren't going to move for the next couple of days. And um, and having uh, having a brokerage or having a 3PL that understands that and is able to communicate that to uh, to shippers. And shippers being able to see it for themselves, not just be told, but be able to get in and see it for themselves and understand it um, for themselves and understand these um, long-term changes. Because effectively, we have moved from a just-in-time system to trying to deal with 20-30% um, coming in and probably coming in at the worst time uh, with the, with the four-quarter um, rush so uh, you can see where all these snippets of information about crime going up, carriers um, being under pressure, shippers investing in visibility platforms, you can see where it's all um, playing its part uh, uh, to, to understand. And it's that 10,000 foot view that makes all the, the, the jigsaw pieces um, pull, to, pull together. It, sound, it sounds simple, but obviously it's obviously it's not. Obviously it's incredibly it's complex. I mean, I mean, it's interesting to see supply chain kind of enter pop culture now. CNN articles on on port delays and really yeah. something coming to the forefront of yeah. people's minds. So, Joe, really appreciate this information. I, I hope it was a um, a good learning discussion uh, for those that were able to join us today. Um, that wraps up our kind of informational portion here. I did want to open the, the floor for any um, Q&A, any questions you have for us. Um, happy to answer those. Um, and again, uh, thanks for joining us uh, today on this uh, supply chain chat uh, sponsored by Siva Logistics. Mm -hmm. So I will open up chat here. Um, it seems, uh, hi Mauricio, it's good to hear from you. Um, so uh, Mauricio says a uh, security agreement between the shipper and the transportation broker, between brokers and subcontractors to define transportation security requirements. 
could mitigate the risk. Um, that's a really good point. So we, we spoke about that chain of understanding on the requirements. It, it's so critical. There's always going to be brokerage and um, forwarding and transportation partners using various parties about the supply chain to get that those goods where they need to be. Um, it's so just critical to make sure that every party within that supply chain has a contractual agreement to abide by those requirements that the shipper had. It's absolutely essential, as well as having those programs to verify that they did abide by those requirements. You can't just take it at the word and you can't just take it at the contract. It has to be verified in real time as well. Yeah, I see uh, I see Chris, uh, who should pay for the cost of visibility. That's, that's, really, that's really interesting. Um, I, I think it's a cost of service. Um, I, I think it's um, it should be added value. Um, so it's definitely a top-down requirement, as in shippers are saying, I want to know this, I want to know, uh, et cetera. So they are going to contract with um, brokers or, or 3PLs or carriers that um, can provide um, can provide that. Of course. We go back to what Connor said then is there's so many different uh, visibility uh, out there. So um, <clears throat> you have to have a system that is flexible enough that is able to take in all these data points um, because you're going to have more than one client. One client might say, I want this uh, visibility. Another client might say he wants a different visibility. So you have to, you have, to have a system that is agnostic um let's say but i think it's it's cost of infrastructure for uh brokers and uh 3pls to say we have this um give us your contract so um that's what shippers are demanding um they could possibly pay more for a better visibility platform with a with a with a selected broker or or a 3pl but I think now it is a requirement and it's built into the cost. That's, uh, that's the way I see it. Um, what do you think, Connor? Yeah, I, I think the cost does tend to ultimately land with the shipper, depending on how they go about it, right? The shipper can deploy their own visibility platform across their 3PLs, or um, a lot of 3PLs brokers have their own value-added security services that they do sell as an additional, additional add-on to their program. Um, yeah. So ultimately, it does end up with the shipper um, managing a lot of that cost for visibility is what, is what we've been seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I think it probably is becoming a bit of um, uh, a blocker now. It, people people um, just presume that uh, you turn on the switch and you get visibility, but there's so many things that you want visibility of from, from weather to door open to temperature, to civil dispute, to um, port movements. Um, there's just so many data points that um, really has to be an agreement between all the parties. What do you want to see? How do you want to see it? Um, and what are we going to do about it as well? <laughs> I haven't previously been being in the uh, alarm industry, I used to always say, um, having an alarm on your house and the bell ringing means nothing unless somebody is going to react to it. So whereas visibility seems to be the new buzzword, um, visibility only enables action. And if, if you don't have an action plan, corrective actions, predictive actions, um, if you don't have an action plan, um, why are you paying for the visibility? You, you have to have a risk management program built around your visibility. Yeah, dots on the map. Dots on the map. You know, are you looking at them at all? It has to be actionable data. Here is what's going on with that dot, not just here's where it is. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I don't see um, if anyone else wants to chime in with a question. Absolutely, we'll 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 take it. 
I did um, receive one question separately. Um, they asked, uh, how long do you expect the supply chain impacts last? So of course mm -hmm. we've seen um, these over the last two years. Joe, I'd be interested to get your thoughts, but I've seen predictions of, of these reverberations occurring through 2023, 2024. Um, we've, we've got quite a bit of supply chain um, I think I think I think it's really that's a that's a fantastic question because I, I think I think the reaction of the industry at the moment is that um, supply and demand has got out of sync. COVID has affected it. Some other things have 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 affected. It's a traffic jam. Let's sweat it out here. Let's um, let's engage brokers. Let's engage three PLs. Let's see the capacity, but the capacity isn't there and. If anything, it's going to get worse before it gets better. That's that's my view. You know, the the containers in um, in Long Beach and in New York, etc., they're not going down. They're going up. So um, you know, there's 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 um, there's army drivers delivering fuel in in the UK. So uh, things. Um, Let's say if there, there's a traffic jam and you go, okay, do I turn off this route now or do I wait and hope that the traffic jam, uh, uh, that's, that's the area that we're in now. And my own personal opinion is, I think things are going to have to change um, and it's going to have to be more investment um, put into the supply chain for more trucks, more drivers, more capacity at ports, more capacity uh, with trains, ships, uh, et cetera. I don't think that this is going to, uh, the traffic jam is going to clear in the next six months. I, I, I think it's going to get worse. So we had a really fine tuned just in time system. And the reason that it's just in time is for financial reasons. If you have a just in time system you don't have to put as much finance into it you, you don't have to carry stock you don't have stock stuck in the um stuck in the supply chain so to me the, the way that it's going to be relieved is probably a balance between increasing the supply chain which will take financial commitment and um the traffic jam beginning to ease a bit but um if you know anything about traffic jams, you'll turn around and go, so do we wait for the traffic jam in Mexico City to ease? How long have we been waiting for that? So uh, so my view is it, it is going to take more investment at all levels in, in, the, in the supply chain. It has, it has changed in the last two years, and I don't see it um, changing back. Personal opinion. What's yours, Connor? It does seem like it's going to take some time. And while it's still getting worse, it's difficult to measure when it's going to get better um, mm. just because it, it seems it's stacking up. Um, so we did get a, a question from uh, Greg here. Um, did the oil spill off of Huntington Beach exacerbate the traffic jam in Long Beach? Is your new partnership with Macquarie allowing you any new access to how this can be fleshed out? That's a great question. Um, so yes, any... Um, environmental impact um, off of the coast is going to impact the influx of vessels into the area. Um, those areas need to be cleaned out for cleanup purposes. Um, and it, it needs, um, it, it's just going to uh, prevent even more ships from coming in. Now, even with the oil spill, right, that doesn't particularly affect the port capacity, there's still an issue of actually processing containers through that port. Um, so although that won't make it any better, that capacity and that, and that, um, that flow through the port is just um, its own issue in and of itself. So certainly not helping, um, but the issue is, is so much bigger than um, a single um, natural disaster or unnatural disaster rather. Um, in that area. And then um, with the partnership with Macquarie, yes, so um, Macquarie has uh, access to quite a few um, port authorities and, and data uh, for those ports across the world. Um, a critical um, aspect is 
of course, understanding, okay, yes, the port's backed up, but when is it going to get better? What is the processing time, container by container, and actually understanding when do we expect that port to clear through its backlog of containers and get freight moving? Um, of course, they're having issues with being able to get drivers to actually take ports as well as uh, take those loads, as well as having um, personnel within the ports to actually process this huge backlog. But having the visibility, maybe not being able to fix the problem, but being able to understand when will the problem be fixed? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? When will my particular container make it through that backlog um, is, a, is a key objective uh, and a very important thing. And i um, glad that our partners at Macquarie have access to a lot of that information as well. Absolutely. And, and um, again, that's where visibility came in. I mean, we've, we've got so many clients moving um, shipments through the port that over time we can say your wait time on ship is, your wait time in port is, um, uh, and that has dramatically gone up. Um, so much so that it, people are considering making uh, different arrangements for product leaving origin to say, are we just going to go to, to that port and back up? So again, visibility gives you um, information that will allow you make better decisions. And not only information from the port itself, but information from the containers that we're tracking through the port, uh, combining all that to allow you make business decisions. And keep hearing it every uh, everyone in transportation that I speak to is um, buy your buy your holiday gifts now. Yeah, bells are going to be empty. Um, it, it, it's not getting any better. It, it's yeah. going. It's going to be an interesting Q four. That we're already. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting that the the ship in the Suez Canal blocked up. Um, so much so that the backload then not only of ships waiting to get into the canal but then them all arriving together in um uh, in their destination points um, and simultaneously then uh eastern europe deciding to upgrade their rail network so shippers moved from ship to rail and then rail got backed up so um uh, along with all the other problems um then you say, how are we going to get this product for Christmas presents? And you see, uh, you, you see shippers now saying, well, I'm going to eat the cost of air freight just to yeah. get my market. Yeah. I'm going to go all air right now because I have to, okay. I can't, I can't get it through the port. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then people go, why is there inflation? Because, uh, you know what? It costs more to air freight than, uh, than it does to stick it on a train or, or stick it on a ship. So, um, so everything everything starts to um, go up. Got a question from uh, Greg. Um, Greg, if you can flesh out what you mean by direct, but I will I will repeat the question. Um, how can Walmart go direct? If you mean um, a visibility solution, um, going direct and actually achieving that themselves, um, that is uh, totally achievable by a company by. Uh, like Walmart, it depends on um, what level of visibility Walmart's trying to get, and it goes. Uh, visibility goes through several levels of complexity, right? You can go from having um, booking their own ships. Um, so, um, I'll give my personal opinion. I'm not an expert on booking ocean freight, so I will discount my opinion there. Um, but it's, of course, building a relationship with those ocean carriers or building a relationship with forwarders, brokers that have those relationships. It's um, similar to the issue we're talking about here in this, in this webinar about um, road capacity and using brokers and, and 3PLs there. Um, it's all about who do you know that has capacity? So reaching out to those even direct ocean carriers what is your capacity? Um, carrying big volume like Walmart does, of course, has its own advantages. Um, being a powerhouse is gonna get you noticed on the capacity side, but also it's about planning ahead of time 
as well, understanding what are your volume expectations and looking out ahead to understand that maybe supply chain in a macro scale isn't getting any better. How do I make my supply chain more resilient? How do I figure out where is my freight at any time across my entire network, across my own assets, across all of my 3PL's assets yeah. as well, to understand how are things moving through the network? Yeah, definitely. I, th I think uh, manufacturers, shippers that are big enough um, are already moving to in-house solutions. They want to own their own fleets. Um, uh, I read an article about a big Scandinavian uh, talking about owning their own ships. So um, if you're big enough, you can absolutely you can absolutely do it. And there's plenty of organizations that are meeting the halfway house. They'll they'll own half their fleet and they'll um, they'll outsource the the other half to a three PL or whatever. But they they want that control. Um, measure that they don't want to be caught with uh, situations like like we're having now so yeah if you're big enough you can absolutely go direct and there's nothing stopping you uh, from doing that but um shipping is a complex business uh, and uh, it shouldn't be entered into lightly i i would uh, i would suggest so um it's it's difficult. Great questions, Greg. We appreciate that. Uh, Joe and Connor, this is Jeff Van Wagner with Engel Logistics. I'm going to piggyback off of uh, Greg's question. Um, there, is, there are reports that uh, the large, uh, the big players out there, Costco and Walmart, they are able to secure their own uh, ships and uh, and put their containers on those ships in order to, to bypass this um, this choke point that's being reported. But what I wonder is, even if they're able to find their own ships, how are they able to get time into the port in order to uh, unload those containers? Yeah. It, it, well, that uh, that is the question. Uh, yeah, they 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 still have to feed into the. The global infrastructure that is ports or railheads, um, etc. And again, personal opinion uh, is, you know, ports are used to dealing with um, um, with brokers, etc. And and uh, that organization for someone new to enter into it and go hello. We own our own ship. When can we come in? Um, uh, that's a that's a difficult uh, relationship to start off new. So um, yeah, own, getting space on the ship um, is one thing, and owning your own ship. Um, but you you still have to feed into these um, in global infrastructure and. Uh, I don't think they can privatize that part. That that they'll still have to queue up in LA and wait for their slot on the dock to offload. That that's the way I would see. Thank you. Jeff, I appreciate the question. So, guys, we're at um, we're at time now. Um, I really do appreciate everyone's time attending the webinar, uh, sponsored by Siva Logistics. Appreciate the, the partnership on this webinar with Siva. Um, if you have any questions for us, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us directly on salesfhall.com. Um, and we really appreciate your time. Hope this was insightful and uh, look forward to uh, speaking to you on uh, the next supply chain chats. Uh, we're planning to host these monthly, various topics. Uh, next one will be a different topic from 3PLs. Um, please tune in for the next one. And, and thanks so much for your time. Take care.